I guess it's time. Um, can everybody hear me? Am I mic'd up? I don't know if it's necessary, but uh, so I'll be talking about uh, density functional theory calculations of defects. So this is a, an outline. So first, I'll you know answer why am I talking about defects and defects in what in particular. Um, so really. Well, I should say up front, I'm really talking about defects in semiconductors. So how defects alter the properties of semiconductors. In particular, I'll go through quite a bit diagrams that look like that on the right. And if you go to any sort of conference on, you know, something which has defects in semiconductors and there are theoreticians there, you will just get inundated with plots that look like that. So I'll try to explain where they come from and how you can get useful information about the material properties from plots like that. And I'll give some examples of real materials like uh, hexagonal boron nitride and tin telluride. Then I'll talk about defect identification and how uh, experiment and theory can work together to really pin down what defects are in the material. And then I'll talk a little bit about going beyond things like formation energy diagrams. And in a kind of a current project we're looking at is uh, spontaneous defect formation, which you can actually see happening using STM. So I should make clear, really, this is all in the context of density functional theory. So there have been talks before. I think you've had some exposure in this series on density functional theory. This is really, this is it. This is one slide. Right? So density functional theory is essentially going from the extremely complicated many-body wave function. So here we're looking at materials. So we have a bulk material. And it really, we're not even looking at the unit cell. We're looking at a big cell because we want to put a defect in it. So we have a big system. And we have, you know, however many electrons there are, and we have this three to the n dimensional, or n to the three dimensional space, not the other way around, dimensional space, right? So it's completely intractable. So density functional theory formally allows you to go from this many body problem to really just a single, single Schrodinger equation with one particle. Right? And you replace electrons with uh, these particles which are not interacting. So they're kind of these quasi-electrons which don't interact with each other, and then you can just populate them in the cone sham orbitals, which gives you the total charge density. And all of the complexity is hidden, and it's all in this exchange correlation potential, which is some functional on the density. There's some exact version which exists, but we use approximations. There are many different approximations you can use like local density approximation, general gradient approximation, the hybrid functionals, and there's really a long list. I'm not really going to go into that aspect of things. But I'll just really say what, what sort of information can we actually get out of calculations like this. Right. So what you can get is atomic structure. So you put in an atomic structure, you calculate you know, the wave function, you, 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 you calculate the helmet feynman forces, you relax it, and you get uh, uh, the atoms move according to the potential, potential energy surface, and you kind of find relaxed states. So you get kind of the final relaxed atomic positions, you get the charge density associated with that, you get the total energy of the system, and you also get eigenvalues. And they're not, you know, they're the single particle eigenvalues associated with the cone sham equation. So it's the... That's the basic information we get out. So, what is a defect? So a defect is, we have a perfect crystal on the left. Anything which breaks that perfect periodicity is a defect. Here I'm really talking about point defects, which would be like, so, so here, let's say this represents gallium arsenide. So one of these atoms is gallium, the other one's arsenide. So if you remove a gallium, then you have a gallium vacancy. That's a point defect. Or if you move, you know, an arsenic, then that's an arsenic vacancy. 
You could have other kinds of defects. You could have one of these atoms in the wrong position. Maybe the gallium is sitting where our stick's supposed to be. So that's a defect. Or, or the other way around. Here I have an impurity. So it's the blue atom. And instead of a, I took a gallium out, I put a silica on it. So these are all just different kinds of defects. So why are defects important? So they're really important for semiconductors. Essentially, all of the electronic properties of semiconductors are because of defects. Semiconductors are their gapped materials. Presumably, they don't conduct. But, you know, we have MOSFETs, we have PN junctions, all modern electronics are based on semiconductors. And it's all because of the defects which exist in the materials. Nice. I, I think I think it might be that. <laughs> Let me see. Cable. Okay. Defects. <laughs> that would be a detrimental defect. So, so you can have beneficial defects, like I was saying before. So some things like dopants, right? If you want it to be an n-type semiconductor, so you want there to be a lot of free electrons, right? Then you can put in dopants to make it n-type, or you know, p-type. You want a p-type, and you can build devices out of things like that. Um, you know, recently we're even talking about uh, you know having defects as your qubit, right? So the different electronic states of a defect in a solid material, manipulating them could serve as a basis for you know quantum information storage, things like that. So those would be beneficial, beneficial things a defect can do. But then there are also you know, detrimental things. For instance, uh, the solar cells. So the way a solar cell works, right, is you have a band gap, light comes in, promotes an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, and you want to separate those and have it do useful work. But you can have a defect in the gap, which traps the carriers and then leads to recombination, things like this. Right, so you, in those situations, you'd want to find out how to get rid of those types of defects. Or they might, you know, pin the Fermi energy and make it so you can't control things the way you want to. So as far as what we get out of DFT calculations. So this really goes to eigenvalues. So here I have electron, uh, electronic transition levels. So things like the you know the band structure that's something we could get out of out of a density functional theory calculation. So on the left I have a bulk semiconductor. Right? So we have the valence band, we have the conduction band, we have some gap. And then I have on the right the same semiconductor but with some kind of a prototypical donor in it. So what's a donor? A donor is just some defect which causes there to be an electronic level near the conduction band. Right? So you know, it really needs to have an electron in that state in order for it to really be a donor. So in this case, we have here, this is, uh, so this is the band structure with the kind of this schematic defect level. And you can also look at the density of states. So here, you kind of look at it from the side. Energy is on this axis, right? and here is the valence band. So if you look at the density of states, once you get below the valence band, there's some density of states there. And after you get above the conduction band, the density of states increases, and then you have a peak in the density of states somewhere in the gap associated with the defect level. Right? So this is just this band structure. If you integrate it in terms of energy, you get something like this. If you integrate the states. And so these correspond to each other. So here we have this defect level, and then the, you know, there's some ionization energy. So what happens is at some temperature, right, you can thermally ionize the electron which lives in this donor state up to the conduction band. Right? So if it's at some finite temperature, if this is a small energy scale, so if this ionization energy is on the order of kT, then it'll be pretty easy for this electron to leave the donor and just you know, be a free carrier of the material. Right? So that would be a good donor. So a good donor would have, you know, ionization energy on the order of KT, which is pretty small at room temperature, something like 30 MeV. So it has to be really close. Because this energy scale, if this is, you know, it's 1.3 EV, or silicon, it's about an EV, 1.1 EV, something like that. Uh, so 30 MeV, that 
It's got to be really close to the band edge to be really effective. So the ionization energy is just the difference here. Here I wrote it in terms of donor, but of course the same holds for an acceptor. Right? So this is the donor on this side. If we had an acceptor, and then we have a state close to the valence band, and then you can view it as either an electron from the valence band, you know, thermally ionizing up to the defect level, or the whole, you know, going down to the, the valence band, you know, either view. So if this is the only defect in our system. So if this donor is the only defect in our system, then we know it, as the temperature goes down to zero, the Fermi level has to exactly be on this donor state. And the reason why it has to exactly be on that donor state is because we, you know, we need to have charge neutrality in the system. Right. So as the temperature goes to zero, everything below the Fermi level is populated and nothing above the Fermi level is populated. Since this defect has this one electron when it's neutral, that means that the, the Fermi level has to really cut that defect level in half so that it's half occupied, everything below is half occupied, and that way you have charge neutrality in the system. Now when you start increasing the temperature, then what you'll find is, is that some of these will be ionized, and you can you know, use a Fermi-Dirac uh, distribution to integrate over the conduction band, and the number of free carriers is going to be equal to the number of charged defects, right? just, just to, to, to keep charge neutrality. So that's a pretty simple picture for donor, but of course you don't ever have a system where you just have one donor and that's it, and, you know, it's end time. So typically you have multiple types of different defects which exist, right? So if we were to have, if you imagine we had donors like this and acceptors like this and we had an equal number of them, there would be no free carriers because the donor, when it thermally ionized to the induction band, this election would just drop down to this acceptor state. And that would be it. That's the only thing that would happen. And then you wouldn't be able to ionize anything from the donor level to the conduction band because there wouldn't be any electrons there. And you wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be able to ionize anything to the acceptor level because they'd be filled already. So they'd be what you'd call completely compensated. So if you want to really know what the effects of the defects are in a system, you have to know every, essentially all of the donors, all of the acceptors which exist in the system, and then determine what the effect is. And determine what the net result of all these different species are. So you need to know how many donors versus how many acceptors there are. So how do you calculate that? So if we want to know how many of something there are, we have to know how much energy it costs to make it. Right? In the ground state, I mean, the, 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 the crystal is the ground state. It's lowest energy state. Any defect, like a missing atom, costs some energy. It's going to be above the ground state. So there's some energy associated with that. So the, the probability that that occurs, right, if we assume that there's not too many of them, is just going to be something like the cost, so a, a Boltzmann factor, really. So, you know, if, if we're talking about a vacancy, so let's say there are n sites in the crystal. So we're talking about gallium, and there are n different gallium positions in the crystal. Each one, it's possible there could be a vacancy. So then the question is, how much energy would it cost to make a vacancy? And the probability that a vacancy exists is just this Boltzmann's factor. So it's e to the minus the energy it costs to create the defect divided by kT. So we expect the total number of that defect just to be the number of sites it could possibly exist at times the Boltzmann factor. Right. So that's kind of a complicated thing looking down here. It's not too bad. So all this is, is it steps through the process of making a defect and it keeps track of all the energy terms. Um, so this is the formation energy of some defect D. That could be anything. In the charge state Q. Okay. So I've got a picture stepping through this process. Here I guess I'll label the terms because I don't know if they're labeled on the, on the next page. 
So this is the total energy of the cell with the defect in it. This is the total energy of the perfect cell. And then this is the change in the number of atoms associated with the, def the, the defect times the chemical potential of each one of those atomic species. And then this is the early energy. I'll, see, I'll show you where this comes from in the next page. So we'll imagine a simple defect formation. So here we have gallium arsenide. It's a perfect cell, perfect crystal. And what we want to do is we want to form this defect here, which is gallium arsenide, except one of the galliums is missing and a silicon is in its place. So how do we create this? So if we were to actually do it with our hands, if we could rip, go into this crystal right, and do this, right, we'd have to go in and we have to rip out a gallium and we have to put it somewhere. Right? So that's the first thing we do. So we go in, we take a gallium, and we put it somewhere. And we have to put it somewhere. You can't just make it disappear. I don't know how much energy it costs to make something disappear. But, I, but we can calculate how much energy it takes to move something from one place and put it somewhere else. So we have to have a reservoir. When we take this gallium out, we put it into some reservoir. Right? And now we have a silicon reservoir somewhere where we just pick up silicon from. It's probably bulk silicon. Right, we take the silicon atom from there, and we put it where the gallium was. Okay, so that's almost, we're almost done already. There's one thing we haven't done yet, because we haven't actually made this defect, because this defect is positively charged. So now we also have to take out an electron from the system. So we take out an electron from the system, and we put that in our electron reservoir. So that's the entire process. Do you have a question? Go ahead, please. With my hands? No. <laughs> no, no, no. But but no, you know we but we do have to keep track of the energies of these things. It matters. And actually, um, you know what this gallium reservoir is and what this sil silicon reservoir is, you can relate to the growth conditions. So when somebody's growing the material, if you grow it with, let's say, a lot of gallium in the vicinity, then this chemical potential will be high. But if you grow it in a situation where maybe there's lots of arsenic and there's not much gallium, then it'll actually be a lot easier to form this defect because the, the, the amount of gallium will be low. So it'll be easier to take gallium out and put it somewhere because that'll be low energy. Right. So, so it, it matters what these, so you really have to keep track of these things. But I don't use my hands. So if you just kind of look at the initial, so we can say this is the initial situation, this is this bulk crystal, and then the final situation is my, my defect cell, but then my reservoir is missing a silicon, my Fermi level has an extra electron at it, and my gallium reservoir has an extra gallium. So this is kind of the final state of the system, and this is the initial state of the system. And this equation is really just this final state of the system minus the initial state of the system energy. That's all it is. So if we look at this energy relation, we say, okay, the final state is, well, we have the energy of this defect cell, which is positively charged, plus a gallium in the reservoir, minus a... Uh, a silicon from its reservoir, plus the Fermi energy. Because the Fermi energy is the electron reservoir. That is where you put the electron. The electron chemical. Oh, go. Yeah. So when you do the Yes. Just replace the atoms, right? The one gallium, one silicon. Yeah, if you were, well, okay. So, what do you do with the electron? So what you have to do with the electron is you have to reduce the, the number of electrons in the system. And typically in a DFT calculation, well, almost always. If it's a periodic DFT calculation, of course, it doesn't make sense to talk about the energy of a charged system because it's periodic, right? So if this is periodic, that means this extends, you know, you know there's an infinite number of charged defects, the, the energy diverges. Right? So in the calculation, what you do, is, or what it's done automatically, really, is there's a uniform compensating charge associated with it. So even though it's, it's, uh, uh, 
you know, net positively charged, there is this, you know, negative compensating background charge. But you can, you know, the energy of that, and then you, you, you add the energy to bring you back to the balance band. Okay. Right. So then this just becomes E final minus E initial. But in two dimensional systems, that, that actually becomes very problematic. Maybe, maybe we'll get to it at the end. I, I don't know. I, I just added a bunch of slides, so we'll see how far we get. Okay, so now back to the growth conditions. So the silicon, we know what that really is. We usually we'd use a reasonable reference like bulk silicon. We know the chemical potential can't be higher than that of bulk silicon because if it were, then it would spontaneously form silicon. Right. Um, now for gallium, the chemical potential, you'll see that it, it it's actually can vary. Right. So at this point, it's typically you you assume there you're near equilibrium growth, which isn't always true. Right. It's actually probably never true. But near equilibrium growth essentially means it's not too energetic. So whatever your source of gallium, whatever your source of arsenic, when you form gallium arsenide, you know, there's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's slightly reversible. So you're just close to, you're close to equilibrium. So if you make that assumption, right, it's not too energetic going forward, then we can approximate the chemical potentials as the, the chemical potential of gallium plus the chemical potential of arsenic is about equal to the chemical potential of gallium arsenide. So in this case, so here I say new gallium arsenide. All that means is, you know, you have a chunk of gallium arsenide, and that's the energy of it. That's, that's all it is. Now, these two can change. And what I mean is, you can, you can satisfy this equation anywhere along the line. Right? So here, imagine we have uh, kind of an axis here. So this is the chemical potential of gallium. This is the chemical potential of arsenic. Anywhere along that line, this equation is true. So those are all growth conditions where you're you know, near equilibrium growth. So typically when you see numbers reported for something like this, if it's grown in a binary, they'll either specify that it's in gallium-rich growth conditions or it's an arsenic-rich growth conditions, which is really one of the extremes of these two possible growth conditions. So in a gallium-rich growth condition, what you say is, okay, well, we know the chemical potential of gallium, actually, yeah, the chemical potential of gallium can't get larger than that of bulk gallium. So we'll just say, okay, it equals bulk gallium. That's gallium-rich. Because if you, were to raise it, if you were to try to raise the chemical potential any higher, then it would just form gallium. So, so you can't raise the chemical potential higher than that. So what you do is you say, okay, well, in the gallium-rich growth condition, the chemical potential of gallium is just given by bulk gallium, and then you just solve for what the chemical potential of arsenic would be in that situation. So if you're growing this material, and there's some gallium forming over here, and you're growing it, then you're really in the, ga you know, the gallium-rich growth condition. Conversely, you can do the same thing in the arsenic-rich growth condition. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you get it from an EFT calculation, you just calculate the total energy of that system, right? Right, sure, and then you just per atom. So... I mean, how do you do that experimentally to know the total energy of both gallium per atom? No, no, you wouldn't do that experimentally. But, but experimentally, you could grow it under gallium-rich condition, right? If you just, in terms of your source, you have much more gallium present, then you'll be in the gallium-rich condition. So you can... So you can really can view this as uncertainty as we don't know what the formation energy is, or you can say, you know, these are things which can guide experiment, because we can calculate in this condition, say, these are the defects which you'd expect, or we can calculate in this condition, say, these are the, de these are the defects you'd, you'd expect. So in this way, theory can inform, you know, experimentalists on how they could change their growth conditions to get defects that they want to get or to avoid different sorts of defects. Okay, so let's go back to this 
formation energy uh, diagrams from the beginning with all of these lines, right? So we know how to calculate the formation energy for this, uh, this silicon and gallium arsenide. So what is this plot? Okay, so if this is just for silicon and gallium arsenide. Right. So, before what we were looking at was we were looking at uh, silicon substituting gallium in the positive charge state. Right. So this is just the equation we had before, which was E final minus E initial for this charge defect. Right. And in this case, we have the energy of this defect cell minus the energy of bulk, plus the different chemical, atomic chemical potentials, and then plus the Fermi energy. All right, so it linearly depends on the Fermi energy, this formation energy of the charged defect. But the neutral, for the neutral defect, you know you don't have to take an electron out and put it in the electron reservoir. Right? You don't you don't move any electrons. So in that case, there is no Fermi level dependence at all. Right? So it's just constant with respect to Fermi energy. So if we plot, right, if we treat the Fermi energy as a variable, because we don't know what it is, right? I mean. Once you have all the information, you can kind of self-consistently find out what it is. But for the time being, we'll just say that we don't know what the Fermi energy is. There could be lots of other things going on in the system which pin the Fermi levels at different places. Now, at each one of the possible locations for the Fermi energy, what would the formation energy be of you know, this, this neutral defect? What would it be for this positively charged defect? Right? So that's what this plot is. So this says, okay, we're, we're assuming that the Fermi energy is somewhere between the valence band of the material and the conduction band of the material. It's very hard to push it too far out of those bounds. So the neutral effect in this case would be when you don't charge pump? Yeah, you don't charge. You just put the you just put it in mm -hmm. and that's it. So in that case, you don't remove an electron from the system. So that, that's this top equation. It's just the same, except we don't have this Fermi energy dependence. In the, in the formation energy equation, we have this plus Q times EF. So Q is just the charge state of the defect. So in this plot, right, this line here represents the formation energy of the neutral defect. It's just a constant throughout the whole plot. Now, the formation energy of the charge defect, well, it's just a straight line. Right? The, only, the only dependence on the Fermi energy is this plus EF, so it has a slope of one because it's a singly charged defect. Right? So that's this line here. Right? So essentially that's all that's being plotted in those pictures, are what the formation energy is for different charge states of defects where you have the formation energy versus the Fermi energy. That's, that's what those plots are. So what does this tell us? So this tells us that if the Fermi energy is in this region, you know, somewhere between here and here, or here and here, right, it says that the formation energy of the positively charged defect is much lower, or at least lower, than the neutrally charged defect. So if the formation energy is lower, then that means we should expect there to be a lot of positively charged defects and almost no neutral defects. Right? So if you think about that in terms of the, the, the defect level position, this corresponds to the Fermi energy being below the donor. So if the Fermi energy is below the donor, that means it's not occupied, it's positively charged. Right? So this defect transition level is actually when this energy balance changes. When you go above this crossing point, then it becomes more likely that it's neutral. So there is kind of this one-to-one -one correspondence, or the thermodynamic transition level is, is very similar. So where these cross is very similar to the electronic defect level. Now there's, there's, slight, there's small differences. So actually, I'll talk about that now. Try to get this more clear. So, electronic properties. Okay. So, we have eigenvalues versus formation energy. So, this top, so ignore this small u for a second. So, here, this is kind of the picture we showed before, where we have, this is the density of states. Right? 
So we have a large number of states over here. This is, corresponds to the valence band. And then up here is the conduction band. And here's the gap. So our defect level is here. So if we look at the defect formation energy of this, we expect something like the picture shown below. Right? Here we have Q is zero is a straight line, right? Because it's charge neutral, that should always be just straight line, doesn't depend on Fermi energy. But if we look, this is an acceptor level, right? It's near the it's, it's near the valence band. When the Fermi energy goes above it, we expect it to become negatively charged. So when the Fermi energy is above this point, we expect the negatively charged defect level to be lower in energy. There should be more of them. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? No? You sure? Okay. <laughs> All right. So when the Fermi energy moves past here, everything below the Fermi energy is populated, right? So the occupation changes from half occupied to another extra electron in the defect state. So it's negatively charged here, right? And that you can see that by this defect transition level is the negative formation energy defect is much more likely to occur. It has a lower energy happening. Right? So that's where they cross. So this is what we call a, a small U defect. And why, well, the reason why it's called small U is really because what happens when we populate this defect level. If you look here, we have this defect level. It's half occupied. We put another electron in the defect level, and it just stays where it is. Right? That, that's nice, but it doesn't have to be true. I mean, that really assumes that the single particle le picture works perfectly. But this is a, you know, this is a, you know, this is a defect quantum mechanical orbital. It can take two electrons. You know, if you have one in there, and you take another one and put it in there, those electrons may repel each other. Right? It doesn't have to stay where it is. If it's, if it's a strong U system, there's a strong electrostatic repulsion between them. Right? And, and the energy level goes up. Right? So this picture doesn't have to be true. Right? You could have something like this. Right? Where you, have, you have one electron in this, this level, you put a second electron in, and it just moves way up. Right? And this is one of the problems with trying to determine the electronic properties of the system solely based on the electronic states, just looking at the spectra. Because if you have something like a large U system, um, I'm not even sure what I would say looking at this, where the, you know, do we ionize to here? Or once you put the electron in, it goes to here, so maybe this is the ionization energy. But this, you don't have this ambiguity if you just calculate the formation energies of the defects. You have your thermodynamic transition level. And, you know, then you know how many, you know, if the Fermi energy is here, you know how many are positively charged, how many are neutral and the number that are, are negatively charged in this case, so you know how many free carriers they are. So you know the effect. Hmm. Similarly, um, the chemistry may change. You put another electron in, so this is really just you know, the defect level moving. But you could put an electron in the system, and there could be chemistry going on, where you have a large structural relaxation that binds, something totally changes. Right? And you can have a large negative U system, where you know, it just goes below the valence band entirely. And then you have no transition level. It just ionizes without any problem at all. So you can, so this is just kind of a, to, to show the difference between calculating the formation energy and why you get these sorts of drawings instead of just looking at the ionization energies from, uh, you know, the different, uh, just looking at the band structure. So the electronic, uh, the electronic properties are better determined by the transition levels. Um, these energy levels can be uh, more important for optical properties, though. I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, especially something like this, right? If we were to, say, shine a light on it, and we promote an electron from this state to this state, okay, sure, there's going to be a structural relaxation later on, but the optical absorption doesn't take that long. That optical absorption happens immediately. The structural relaxation takes a long time. All right, so thermodynamically, you know, if you're looking at the electron effects, maybe, yeah, this is the one you should be looking at. But if you're looking at optical absorption, then you really should be looking at you know, these defect levels. 
Okay. So, hexagonal boron nitrite, monolayer. The two lowest energy defects are this, uh, this uh, vacancy, this boron vacancy, and this nitrogen at the boron site. So looking at something like this, what can we say? The quiz. So we've come to the quiz portion. Right. So what do we expect? Do we know where the Fermi energy should be? Are there going to be more boron vacancies, VB, or there's going to be more NB? Well, to really know, we need to know what the Fermi level is, right? So if the Fermi level is over here, let's say the Fermi level is right here, what are there going to be more of? Well, let's say it's right here. Which one has a lower formation energy, NB or VB? Right. So if the Fermi energy were here, there would be a ton more VB than there would be, uh, there would be a ton more vacancies than antisites. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is, okay, so these, these vacancies are negatively charged, right? And we're quite, quite a bit away from the band edge. So there's almost no free carriers. So if we say the Fermi energy is here, then we break charge neutrality, Right, because we have a ton of negatively charged vacancies. We don't have any positively charged defects, or very little, because it's pretty high at energy. So what will happen in a situation like this is they typically say that the Fermi level's pinned. Right, is if you're growing this material, what will happen is the Fermi energy will adjust itself so that the system is charge neutral. Right, so if it were here, if you, if you imagine that the Fermi level were down here, then that means, you know, we have more and more positively charged defects. When you put a positively charged defect in the system, that increases the Fermi energy. So this is, a lot of donors can be made, but then they push the Fermi level up. And then if you were, also if you were here, that means you form lots and lots of negatively charged defects, acceptors, which bring the Fermi level down. So, th there's only one position, essentially, here, where you get charge neutrality. And then you have the same number of donors as acceptors. So that's a situation where it's, they're compensated. And actually we have, you know, experimental evidence for this. Uh, this is from uh, Gangu, UTK, where you did these STEM images of HBN. And, you know, you do these large scale, essentially counting the individual defects. I don't think you count it by hand. But, you know, looking at the different, uh, so, so you can kind of see different signatures of different defects, and then you get, you know, very similar numbers of these vacancies and antisites. I mean, this is a statistical counting error, the fact that they're different. Okay, so another example. So native defect study on uh, tin telluride. So people are interested in tin telluride because it's this uh, crystalline topological insulator. But as grown, they always find it to be heavily p-type. I mean, when I say heavily p-type, I mean the the uh, the Fermi levels below the valence band <laughs> maximum. So it's, it's heavily p -type. Um which is unfortunate because really to use the topological properties, you really want to move the Fermi level inside the band gap to be able to take advantage of surface states which could appear in things like this. Right. So we looked at uh, uh, we did a native defect study just to, to determine the effect of uh, defects on the electronic properties. So in a system like this, it's just a rock salt structure. 
between uh, Tin and Telluride, so you can have uh, vacancies, interstitials, and I sites. This had an interesting consequence. Was so this is yeah this so this one this one you can tell is from the paper because we have you know tons of different defects and it looks really messy. Right? Um, so in this case, what we found was it doesn't matter what growth condition you're under. So if you're under a tin rich condition or a tellurium rich condition, we find that the the formation of the vacancy is negative. So the formation and energy of the vacancy is negative over the entire range of the Fermi energy, which is uh, which would be in the gap, right? So what does that mean? Right? I mean, if you kind of look at it in terms of just you know the number of uh, sites, how many defects you have. Ugh, if it's negative, then that means this becomes larger than the number of possible sites. So this just this whole thing breaks down. Right? Um, it just says that it doesn't want to form. That material does not want to form right? because it is lower in energy to, to make vacancies. And if you're making vacancies, then you're really just making bulk tellurium. You're not making tin telluride, right? If you if you have vacancies, uh, so it'll it'll want to phase separate. If the if the Fermi energy is in between the valence and the conduction band, right? so in order for them to actually successfully grow it, it can only be grown if the Fermi energy is down below the valence band. Right? You can kind of see this, right? So here's the uh, this is the acceptor, right? So this is the uh, the, the selenium uh, the tin, tin tin vacancy, right? So it's the acceptor. If, if you were to go to lower Fermi energies, this would get higher in energy. So at some point, it will be positive in energy. It's just somewhere below the valence band of the material. So, there's a, there's a, there's a related material, uh, lead telluride. So that one doesn't have this problem. So you can kind of get a little sneaky if you alloy tin telluride with lead because that lowers the valence band of the material, in which case the vacancy now becomes positive energy. But you're kind of moving actually away from this material when you do that. Okay, so there are any questions on what I talked about here. Can you guys read things like this now, or was that to go too fast? Good? Okay, so what is this? <laughs> what, what can we say from this figure? What can we say about this material? Is it going to be... Is it going to have a lot of free carriers? Assuming that this is complete, these are all the defects that exist in the material. Was that? What was that? Oh, bismuth and the tellurium. That, that's the lowest energy defect. Um, but where's the Fermi energy going to wind up? Right. So to determine if there's going to be a lot of free carriers, we have to think about where is the Fermi energy going to wind up in this situation. So if we assume the Fermi energy is up here, then that means we make a lot of acceptors, which lowers the Fermi energy. All right? So kind of 
the most probable place I would say would be somewhere kind of where this donor is, yeah, somewhere in here. So it'll be essentially mid-gap. So we wouldn't expect this to have a lot of free carriers, either holes or electrons. Yeah. How do we estimate? Um, well, I mean, think about in order for the Fermi energy to get pushed, in order for the donor to be effective, right, or the acceptor to be effective, it really needs to be the lowest energy defect, right? And it needs to have a state, in the case of a donor like this, it really has to have a state near the, the, uh, the bandage. If you look at this in terms of uh, kind of this electronic level picture, the transition level is near where the electronic level is, and it can thermally ionize. Now, if we look at this in terms of the electronic picture, right, the defect level is here. So it's very far from the bandage. You really couldn't ionize to, to the bandage. Right? Um, so, I mean, that, that's kind of an electronic uh, level perspective. But if this were to, so, so one could just say, well, this is an acceptor, but it's very deep. Look how far away it is from the valence band. Right? It's, it's almost, it's more than half of an EV. It really needs to be like 0 0.03 EV to be effective, or something like 0 0.05 EV to be thermally ionized near room temperature, something like this, right? Um, so, right. So for that to be the case, then you'd really just have to be lower and have to have a crossing down here. Um, so another way to look at it is, this slope will push, as you form more acceptors, it will push the Fermi energy closer and closer this way. Right? So if it were like this, then yeah, it would push the Fermi energy very close to the band edge. But it stops pushing when it becomes neutral because you're no longer making you know, charged acceptors anymore. So if we assume the Fermi level's here, this, the presence of this acceptor, you form these negatively charged defects, it pushes the Fermi energy down, 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 and then it just kind of stops. You start forming the neutral species. So you just kind of wind up in the middle. Like when they cross, you can think about it the same way. Push this way, push that, and you wind up in the middle. Okay. So now I'll talk a little bit about uh, defect identification. I mean, a large part of you know doing calculations like this is uh, working with experimentalists, right? For I mean, uh, you know, they do experiments and they're not quite sure what they see. You do calculations, you're not sure which approximations are valid, and you kind of meet in the middle and, and you try to figure out what's going on. And think for for. Layered material, so this is an example of a layered material. So this is bismuth selenide, which is a topological insulator. So these come in you know, strongly bound quintuple layers. So we have five atoms, you know, uh, five monolayers, which are tightly bound, but then you have really weak binding between layers. Um, so materials like this, it's actually quite interesting because you can really bring to bear um, STM to get a look at what the bulk defects are. So SDM is a surface sensitive technique. You can really look at the surface of a material, right? Um, but when you have a layered material like this, what you can do is, you know, you have your bulk material, but then you cleave the surface and you just chop it off, right? And you do that, right? And then you examine the surface, but since this is a very weak bond, you're essentially looking at what the bulk would be. So it's a, a nice tool for seeing what's in your bulk material. Um, so, yeah, so you see something like this. It's a big zoo, right? <laughs> so this was done with uh, Wido Wu, who's at uh, Rutgers. Right? So he did these STM images, right? and you know, 
And this is a particular type of defect, this is a type of defect, that's a type of defect, this is a type of defect. All these different types of defects. Okay. Um, we did some uh, formation energy uh, diagrams and we found that vacancy should be quite low in energy in the system. Um, it's intrinsically, bismuth cyanide is intrinsically n-typed in these vacancies or donors. Um, so how do we help experiment determine what these are? Right? So we can simulate STM images from the charge density in the DFT calculation. So what's going on in STM? In STM you have your sample, right? You have your tip. So we can look at it. This is kind of a, a rough uh, density of states of my sample. So here we have a, this is the conduction band with some kind of a defect level, and this is the valence band, and then for the tip, it's even rougher. It's just a metal, right? So we've got states everywhere for the tip. So when they do uh, when they do STM, they apply a bias, and essentially what that is is it is some 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 field or some. Essentially, what they're doing is they're they're making there be a difference between the Fermi level in the uh, sample and in the tip. Right? So this is the Fermi level in the, in the, in the metal tip, is here, and this is the Fermi level in the, uh, in the sample. Right? So what that allows to happen now is we have all of these states right, in the sample, which now have states they can tunnel to in the tip. Right? Um, so this tunneling probability, or the, the, the current really, Right, you can use the tersoff hammond approximation, and from that, if you assume that it's an S-wave process, you can um, calculate the, the, uh, the current by approximating it from the, just really the charge density. Right? So here the charge density integrated, well, it's the integrated charge density over this energy region is proportional to the current. So when they do these uh, calculate, when they do these uh, experiments, right, they have these colors, right? So this color typically isn't the current. What they do is, I mean, it can be, but typically you do what's called constant current mode. So in constant current mode, what they do is they say they have a fixed set current. They say at this current will stop. So they can move this tip and they get closer and closer to the sample until they hit that current. Then they move over a little bit and then they adjust the height of the tip until they get the same current. And then they move it over a little bit. And they adjust. So they go through, you know, essentially this, this large scale area where they, you know, adjust the height of their tip to, to have a constant current. And what they're actually plotting is the height of their tip. That's what the color is in that image. So, if we look at, uh, let's say, let's say we have this region of charge density we've integrated over, here I'm plotting an isosurface of the charge density. So this, you know, the charge density has a different value for every point in space, so it's very difficult to visualize. So what you do is you pick a specific value, right? If you pick a specific value of the charge density, then you can plot this, you know, nice 2D image. But that's really... You know, in, in the tersoff hammond approximation, that's exactly the heights that which correspond to STM heights, right? So what you can do is you just take your charge density like this and then color the image based on the, the height of the isosurface and you can essentially simulate the STM results within from this approximation. So we did that with some success for uh, 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 the selenide. Right? where it's actually interesting because they don't just see the, the top layer. Right? They actually can see, you know, so this is the selenium vacancy, right? this is on the very top layer, but then this is in the middle layer, and this is five layers deep, you get a bigger image, then six layers, so you actually have 
you know, top layer, fifth layer, sixth layer. And the deeper you get, the, the kind of the larger scale the images go, and which kind of makes sense if you, you know, look at, you know, uh, the calculation, right? If you have a, a perturbation down here, as that propagates, you know, it, it reaches a larger area on the surface. But then they also get dimmer and stuff. So when you get really deep, you, you can't see anything. It all gets washed out. Simulate all the seven layers. Um, simulate all the seven layers. Yeah, yeah there's some calculations. <laughs> it has to be pretty big. You need at least, uh, you know, because this, this image, right, has to fit in, in your supercell. So you need something like, you know, as far as, you know, something like eight by eight in the, in the x-axis, and then you need to go down. So it's a it's a pretty big cell. Yeah. Yeah. Images on the left were Uh, right were simulated. Right. Uh, the black and white ones are simulated. Right. In fact, it's interesting because um, from this study, we found that uh, kind of contradicted our, our formation energy plots. Only in that. Uh, they found many more vacancies in this third layer. But when we calculated the, the energetics, we always found that you know, the vacancies on the top or down here are lower in energy. <laughs> so we kind of puzzled over that for a while. Um, in the end, um, we attributed it to kinetics. Because really, we um, when you calculate the formation energies, you really make a pretty large assumptions of thermal equilibrium, right? But you kind of do more than that um, because the question is, you have this, you know, you have your, your N equals number of sites times this Boltzmann factor. So the question is, what's our temperature? Right. What, what is the temperature? Because so when you think about it, you think about you know maybe growth temperature. Um, at growth temperature, species are mobile, so you can imagine that you can reach thermal equilibrium at a high temperature. But if we suddenly quench it, all the defects get trapped. So you know when you're at room temperature, you have more defects in your material than you, then, then this would suggest. So typically, when you, if you would apply this to a real system, you think about what the growth temperature is, and you calculate the defects based on the growth temperature, but then they can get locked in when, when the system cools down. Right? I mean, you can't just bring the system down to 4K and the defects are going to disappear. In order for it to actually disappear, you know, there has to be some kinetic pathway where it has enough energy to go over the barriers in order to reach equilibrium. So, in principle, it would reach equilibrium eventually, but not at any time in a reasonable, you know, universe time scale. Um, so, there's the there's the possibility then that different defects are mobile at different temperatures. So, something like, you know, a vacancy here might get trapped at a higher temperature, right? And then a vacancy on this layer really is a, at a lower temperature. So kinetics can play a role in these things. And you just have to be cognizant of that. Um, it's probably most obvious in the, the kind of this current work we're doing, this manuscript we're finishing up, which is a different material entirely. It's this uh, bismuth tellurium chloride. It's another layered material. Right? Um, this is also from, from Wida, and it's very interesting. He, 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 he does a low temperature cleave, right? No, low temperature, and looks at it, and there are essentially no defects. Very few defects. If he cleaves it at room temperature, then you get a bunch of defects. And it's even worse than that, or better, depending on how you view it, right? is if you cleave it at low temperature, and then you let it warm up, 
right? So here, this is, you can let it warm up for eight minutes. So you got a couple of defects. You let it warm up for 75 minutes. Then you just have defects everywhere. So as time goes on, you let it, you cleave it, which is the bulk. So, so this is all, this is one of the nice things about layered materials is when you chop it, you really, you know, get a good idea of what the bulk is like. So you, you chop it, right? you see the bulk, oh, there are no defects in the bulk. But then if you just wait, they form spontaneously. So the question is, what is going on? So right, so we, we looked at this at this uh, material, right? So th this is a, a picture of the supercell we used. So kind of a standard supercell size. I don't know if it's standard. This might be a little biggish, but you want you want enough room in your supercell so that defects from one supercell don't interact with their periodic images. So you try to get a, a, a big uh, supercell. Also, the uh, air is due to charge this jellium compensating charge disappear as the as the cell gets larger. So here, you know, we looked at vacancy defects. So, you know, we have three different types of atoms. Right? We looked at anisite defects, so we, now we have more antisites. Actually, in this case, the uh, chemical potential gets harder, right? So before we looked at, you know, for the gallium arsenide example, anywhere along that line, is a possible uh, uh, growth condition. Here, since we have three atoms, now we have a plane. Right? So where you, you be near equilibrium growth anywhere on a plane, right? and still have this. Um, so, okay, so these are formation energies of tellurium and bismuth um, related to defects. Okay, related defects, okay. So here I have just bismuth and tellurium rich conditions. Here's the chlorine I just assumed was uh, 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 Cl2, right? So that one I just fixed. So we didn't explore this whole uh, surface. Right? So looking at the formation energies, so this is the, the diagram I showed on the introduction. Right? So we should already kind of have an idea of what's going on. Right? We expect that the Fermi energy be somewhere in the middle of the gap, and then if we're in tellurium rich, it should be somewhere you know, still quite away from the band edge. We wouldn't expect many defects. So it depends on which condition we're in. If we're in the bismuth rich condition, the formation energy of the lowest energy defect is about 1 eV. So we don't expect very many. So 1 eV, so 1 over 0 0.0, maybe 0 0.1 <coughs> max. And then we have e to the 10, so, you know, 1 in 1,000 maybe, something like that. The, yeah, actually, 1 in 1,000 is the max on that. So, yeah, 10,000, I think it's better. Approximation. So, we expect the Fermi energies to be somewhere near the middle of the gap. Formation energies are reasonably large, so we don't expect a lot of defects. So, what's going on in this material? So a hint is that this is a polar material. It's one of the reasons why people are interested in it. Right? You have this giant Rochbaugh effect on the surface, and it really has to do with the fact that you have this you have chlorine, bismuth, tellurium, so that you don't have inversion symmetry. So what you have here, if you look at this, right? so chlorine, bismuth, tellurium, if you look at the electrostatic, so this is just, I have you know three, Tri layers of this material. So this is just a calculation of three tri layers and vacuum. And you plot the uh, electrostatic potential. So this is just the electrostatic potential as a function of position. Right? You see it goes down and it actually steps down each time. So the electrostatic potential just keeps going down, down, down because you have this dipole, dipole, dipole. Now, if you kind of naively extend this picture, I mean, you can't do this ad infinitum, right? But if you were to kind of make this longer and longer and longer, then we expect the potential on one side just to get much lower than the potential on the other side. But this can't happen, 
It can't happen on it. It can happen to some degree. Uh, the reason why it can't happen is because there's a valence band. There's a conduction band, right? So if we if we think about you know the valence band and the conduction band on one side of the material, the valence band and the conduction band on the other side of the material, right? If this potential is going down, then this is moving down, 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 down. At some point, the valence band on this side of the material is going to be higher than the conduction band on this side of the material, and electrons will transfer to make sure it doesn't happen anymore. So kind of to illustrate that idea, if you imagine we had the conduction band and the valence band as a function of space, right? And we had this potential which was just linearly changing as a function of position, then over here, the conduction band would be lower than the valence band over here, right? So we'd have to have some charge transfer to make sure that that could happen. So what you'll wind up with, though, is you'll wind up with, on the tellurium terminated surface, the Fermi energy locally looks like it's, you know, in the conduction band. And on the, on the chlorine terminated surface, the Fermi energy looks like it's in the valence band, or it looks like, I mean, the, you, can, you, know, you can view it as the bands are fixed and the Fermi energy changes, or you can view it as the Fermi level is fixed, which is probably more physical, and then the band bends down. But regardless, if you're sitting here on this tellurium surface and you have your bands, you know, you have free carriers because the Fermi energy is above your conduction band. So if we re-examine what we had, right? So we have these defects, and we say, no, no, the Fermi energy isn't here, because we're not in bulk anymore. We make this cut, we're on the surface, and we get all these electrons just start populating, you know, we have all these free carriers, so that means that at the surface, the Fermi energy is here. It actually could be even higher, right, because there are tons of uh, electrons in the conduction band. So when we look at our formation energies, well, now all of a sudden we have these defects which are really easy to form. Right? If you look at bismuth, the tellurium site, the formation energy almost goes to zero, right? Well, actually, it goes past zero, below zero. So we have these defects like this, and we have the, the, uh, the bismuth vacancy is another one. So yeah, on this side, depending on the growth condition, we have this bismuth vacancy. The formation energy is down here somewhere. So energetically, these things really want to form now. Now that we've, we've cleaved this surface, we, we, even though there are no defects starting out, they really want to form. Uh, whether or not they can form or can't form depends on the kinetics of the situation. I mean, thermodynamically, they want to. And so the question is, is there a barrier for them to form or not? Right. Um, in this case, uh, interestingly enough, there's not much of one, which I guess should be obvious given the experiment. Right. All right. So uh, another thing we can calculate right, is uh, you know if we were imagine the formation of a defect. So this isn't this isn't the formation energy uh, you know that we were talking about before. Right. The formation energy we were talking about before was really just keeping track of the, the final state and the initial state, the total energy difference, the thermodynamics. Right? But this is really the physical process of creating it. So this is the kinetics of the process, the barrier to get to your final state starting at your initial state. So if we kind of, so what this plot is, is kind of our reaction coordinate. So if we start in the perfect position, so perfect lattice, and then we slowly pull this bismuth out, how does the energy of the system change as a function of pulling this out? So if you, if you look at things this way, you can see that the energy goes up, 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 and then maybe there's a new minimum. All right, so this corresponds to, you know, forming a vacancy. Um, but here, if you calculate how difficult it is, so here, this is a huge barrier. I just to give you a feel. Um, so this is more than, so this is with Q equals zero. So this is, I have a neutrally charged cell. Right? So this is what we expect if you're really not at the surface, right? And, you know, if we just do this naively and we pull it out, 
we have this, this huge barrier. So 1.5 EV is not something which is accessible at, you know, room temperature even. You know, you'd have to go to pretty elevated temperatures to be able to go over that barrier. You know, maybe, maybe half an EV at room temperature is sort of about right if you, if you wait long enough, but this one EV is just way up. Um, but if you, so why does the energy go up here? So this really has to do with how defect levels evolve as you pull it out. Um, so uh, maybe I'll do that at the end because it's a follow-up slide. I wasn't going to get into it. Okay. So the point here, though, is that if you charge the system, so you put in additional electrons and then do the kinetics, these electrons can fill levels which get lowered in the process and stop the formation of this large barrier. So if you do the kinetics in the negatively charged state, you actually find the barrier is quite small, quite manageable at, at lower temperature. So, so not only does the, the you know, thermodynamics favor the formation of these defects, they're, they're kinetically allowed. So then you, you see them just form in real time on the order of 10 minutes. 20 minutes, that sort of thing. Prevent defects. <laughs> Keep it at a very low temperature. <laughs> um, you would have to somehow charge it. Yeah, I mean, to mess with the potential, you'd have to charge it, right? So one can view the reason why these defects form is because they want to get rid of that charge on the surface, right? So if you if you put if you put different defects on the surface, let's say let's say you didn't like these defects, but you had another donor in mind that you wanted to put on the surface, then that would be fine. Oh wait, acceptor, sorry. Yeah, another another acceptor, right? And you, you put a bunch of you decorate it with a bunch of acceptors external, then that would lower the Fermi energy and then these defects would form. Like if you were to posit those, for instance, at low temperature. So that would be a way to prevent these kinds of defects, but I think something's going to happen. Yeah, you've got to somehow manage it. Um, so let's see. So I guess last, I just really wanted to talk about some technical challenges for uh, uh, defect formation energies in two-dimensional systems. Right. Um, and this really goes to your earlier question. So why do they cleave it in the first place to actually make these layers? Uh, no, they cleave. See, so they don't get rid of it. They don't cleave it. They don't. They're not taking out a little tiny piece. So they have a big sample, right? And the surface, you know, maybe it was exposed to air. You know, there could be all sorts of things going on, right? So they want to see what's going on in the bulk. So then they just cut off the top. You know, and they do this, you know, in vacuum at low temperature. So they just cut off the top and then they look and they say, so when they look at the surface, uh, they're really seeing what's going on in bulk. And it's different than, let's say, you know, a normal semiconductor where it's not layered because then you'll just see a bunch of surface uh, phenomenon, right? This, it's, since it's Van der Waals bound, right, then it's very loose and you don't really, you're not really doing anything with the chemistry. Yeah, right, but, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's unusual. That's an unusual phenomenon. It's really because it's so polar. Or polar. I think it's unusual. We'll see. Okay, so some technical issues with two-dimensional system. And this is just, yeah, I don't think I'm going to get deep into this. This is just more of a warning, right? If you're doing, you know... You know, you have your 2D system, a TMD, and you want to calculate formation energies of defects and draw these plots. Right? You really need to perform corrections or else you run into errors. Right. Um, so one way to look at this um, is the, how people do the 3D calculations. So this is what I mentioned before. Right. is you have this three-dimensional bulk system and right? you put a defect in it and you compensate it with some it's the word is jellium this compensating background charge is is called jellium and they just spread it out through the cell so there's an there is an error associated with this um, 
And we know how it behaves. It roughly scales like 1 over L. And people do extrapolations, and they show, you know, in the infinite size limit, it'll go to this number. Um, but usually you don't have to worry about it overly much because it typically is, you know, about a 50, if you have a, you know, a couple hundred atom cell, it's going to be less than 0.1 EV, you know, 50 MeV. So a lot of times you don't go through such a Herculean effort to, to just try to figure this out. Um, 2D is different. Right. Um, and the reason, or at least, you know, is that at least as you make the vacuum size larger and larger, right, um, things don't converge. And which was kind of strange originally, um, but you know, people have been doing this for the last, you know, five years or so, a lot of TMDs, formation energy plots. Um, but initially it was strange, just from the experience with using bulk materials, because you just go bulk material, you just make it bigger and bigger and bigger, it's always better, you know, because you, you kind of minimize the effect of the jellium on the defect in that interaction energy. But if you think about what's going on when you have a charge defect in a 2D material, right? And if you want to make the, if you're doing a 2D material, these, these calculations, it's all done in reciprocal space and you have, you know, so, so you do things in periodic cells, right? So you have a periodic cell like this. And you, you have, so really what you're simulating here isn't just one sheet. It's a sheet with a sheet with a sheet with a sheet, and each one is a defect, a defect, a defect, a defect. Right? So, you know, you would think that if you were to make these sheets further and further apart from each other, you know, it would be good. They wouldn't interact with each other as much. Um, but if you look at the compensating background, so here, let's just say the charge defect is this yellow portion. All right, so let's say it's positive. And then the jellium or the negative charge is spread throughout this entire cell. So as you make Z bigger and bigger and bigger, the, the, the negative charge is getting further away from the positive charge. It's just getting further and further away. So you can actually view this as you know, a charged positive plate and this negatively charged plate, and you're just moving them apart. And you can actually show that the total energy diverges with respect to LZ. If you just make LZ bigger and bigger and bigger, the energy of the charged system increases linearly. So, so that's what this plot is. <laughs> so, so if you, you calculate, you know, you know this is, uh, I don't even remember which material this was in. Um, uh, it looks like boron nitride, actually. So carbon and boron nitride positively charged. Um, so as you increase the, the Z, you just calculate the formation energy of this defect. This is for a uh, fixed Fermi energy. So this isn't one of the plots where you do Fermi energy versus formation energy. In this plot, we're actually just increasing the size of the vacuum, and we just have one Fermi energy. And it just increases, 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 increases. So to calculate the ionization energy, you know, it's the, the charge defect minus the neutral defect. So this comes directly into that. So for a while, people were doing, you know, 2D calculations, calculating formation energies, but, you know, just kind of different people would use different vacuums. You just get different numbers. You know, so there's all these issues, right? So this isn't something, so this diverts. So you could literally get any number based on how much vacuum you put in. Uh, you get ionization energy larger than the gap. You know, it doesn't, doesn't even necessarily make sense. So it's just a, a warning that you really need to control for this sort of error if you're doing charge defects in 2D materials. Um, so we looked at this problem. Uh, yeah, okay. This might be a bit much. Um, but we looked at this problem. And we just looked at it in terms of we have some ionization energy that we, if we naively calculate it, right, we can expand it in terms of LS and LZ. We don't know what the powers are. We're assuming it could be positive, negative. You just double expand everything, just as general as we could be, right? 
So what we wanted to do is we wanted to determine which, which of these coefficients aren't zero. Right. So what we did is we decided to take three physical limits for which we know what this is analytically. So one of them was easy. We know that, we already know that if we increase LZ and make it go to infinity, we know that this thing diverges linearly, right? So that means, what does that mean? Well, how do we know that? So here, this is just kind of shows you kind of the picture we have in our heads. When you make LZ larger, right, you can, you can imagine, so this is a periodic, so you get a system which looks like this. Right? So this is just a bunch of, because it's periodic in these directions as well, so you have a bunch of charge defects in a plane, and then you have this compensating charge between them. Right? So we can kind of, kind of translate this you know, as we get larger and larger to this continuous model, right? in which case we just have a charge plane with compensating charge far away from the... So we, we can directly just integrate this and calculate what the energy of such a system is. And if you do that, you get this Q squared over 12. So you, you get an exact result for what that is. So we know how this diverges. We know that it diverges linearly with LZ. So that means that terms that have LZ squared in them must vanish. So none of the coefficients which have an LZ squared in this expansion are non-zero. So that gets rid of you know, an infinite number of terms going that way. Then we can do a similar thing in the other direction. If we keep LZ fixed and we make LS get larger, right, then we can go to a continuous model, which is a cylinder. Right? And then we can throw out a bunch of other terms because we get a logarithmic divergence, and then it, it's, it gets a little bit messy at that point. But really, it's just to get to the end result, which was, you know, what kind of equation can we use to determine what the true ionization energy of the system is? So we don't know what this ionization energy is, we know what this factor is. We don't know what that factor is. So essentially, we have two unknowns, and we have to do several calculations with different LS values and different LZ values to fit what these is, what those are. And then, you know, then we can get the true ionization energy of the system. So that's kind of the, the general idea behind that paper. Um, so... Uh, one of the results was, was this uh, MOS2, and we really found that, you know, the kind of this breakdown of this electronic viewpoint, because in, in 2D materials, you have this very strong exciton binding. Right? And in, if you calculate the formation energy, you get uh, kind, of, kind of quite deep levels. Right? which is consistent with this large exciton binding. It's hard to take an electron from the excitonic state and make it a free carrier. Right? But if you look at kind of the uh, electronic structure, it's very close to the band edge. But I just, I just want to make that point. But I think I'm really done. I think that's, that's pretty much the end. Uh, so are there any, any questions? The, the, the last part was a bit rushed, I guess, but... Uh, Well, thank you.